Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. And happy Mother's Day to all the moms. And trust will be a, a blessed day for you with, with your children, with your families. And I'm just glad you're here this morning with us and looking forward to this day. Looking forward to tonight. That'll seem a little bit strange. I know a lot of you have other plans. You may not be able to be here tonight. Or maybe you're like Paul who has to go home and fix a broken bathroom. So I don't know what the story may be for you, but we're very glad you're here. And if you're able to come back tonight, that'd be great. We're going to meet here at 6 o'clock tonight in the auditorium. Can't hear me? All right, hold on just a minute. All right, can you hear me yet? All right, let me start all over again. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms. Trust will be a blessed day with your families, and I'm glad you're part of our service here today. And also, just want to remind you that tonight we're going to meet at 6, and I know a number of folks have already told me that you're not going to be able to be here tonight because of Mother's Day, but if you are able to be here, we'll meet in the auditorium at, at 6 o'clock, so look forward to that. So, as we begin this morning, we'll do as we do each Sunday, we'll sing together, so if you'd like to take your uh, song list out, and we'll sing together right there inside your bulletin, we'll sing a great song, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul, like a sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I have ceased from my wandering and going astray. Since Jesus came into my heart, and my sins, which are many, are all washed away. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul, like a sea billows roll, since Jesus came into my heart. I'm going to have Brother Paul come up. And he'll he'll do what he does normally. I hope it's good today, and uh, he'll lead us in prayer afterwards as well. Good morning. Hi. Uh, if you are happy to be in our parking lot today, I need you to raise one hand way up. And if you are thankful for your mother, we're going to raise the other hand way up. I apologize to my mother, I'm holding a mic, I can't do it right now. And while we have our hands in the air, all God's people said, praise the Lord. Uh, today is Mother's Day. Uh, each and every mother that is in attendance has or should have received a special gift. If you have not, please see one of the attendants in the parking lot and we'll make sure that you get that. And we do thank you. Thank you for being a mother. Thank you for being a mom. Uh, we do well, our drive-through or our drive-in services will continue uh, each Sunday morning until we're told that we can meet in the auditorium. Uh, we will be live streaming each service on Facebook. Also, you could you could uh, watch the recorded services on our website. Uh, Sunday evening and Wednesday evening services will be conducted in the auditorium. That's beginning this evening. You are under no obligation to attend any of the services. If you're not feeling well or you feel uncomfortable, please stay at home, watch the live streaming services, or watch them on the website. Uh, there is a deacons and trustees meeting next Sunday evening. For the deacons and trustees, please make a note. Uh, this is going to be May the 17th. It's going to be immediately after the evening service. And the last thing that I have in 
you know, in honor of Mother's Day, you know, in our congregation or in our parking lot today, we have doctors, we have nurses, we have teachers, we have medics, we have police officers, we have carpenters, repairmen, we have principals, we have lifeguards, we have security guards, we have chauffeurs, we have mechanics, house cleaners, and cooks. And you know, when you combine all those professions together, they call them mothers. You know, most of you are aware that Mother's Day was actually started in Grafton, West Virginia. It was a first. You know, mothers have been involved in a lot of firsts over the years. And I wrote down just a few firsts that mothers have been involved in. The first participation trophy was your mother's smile and applause after you performed one of the simplest tasks, like poo-pooing in the potty. You know, the first baby wipe was a little dab of your mother's saliva on a tissue. It can clean and sanitize anything. The first band-aid was your mother's hug after you fell and got a boo-boo. The first painkiller was your mother's kiss on that boo-boo. The first security alarm was your mother's firm yet loving no after you were about to do something dangerous. And then lastly, the first rocking chair was when your mother cradled you in her arms for the first time and gently rocked you to sleep. Thank you very much. I like that. That's very good. Hey, right before we sing again, I just want to recognize a couple folks that are here today. Uh, Kyle and Jennifer Heinzman are here, and I think most of you know that Kyle was up in New York City uh, aiding the area there with uh, such a terrible degree of the COVID virus and uh, he and Nathaniel Smith were both stationed up there ministering to people and Kyle's back home now he finishes two weeks of quarantine so we're glad he's safely back I'm sure he's grateful to all those who prayed for him and for Nathaniel as well we're glad glad to have him back today and uh, Don and Marianne Myers are here of course you know Don's been you know in, in this battle physical battle right now and just glad they're able to be with us today, and uh, just for everybody, I'm glad you're here. We're going to sing one more song, and so if you would, take your song list there, and we'll sing, Fairest Lord Jesus. Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, oh, thou of God, and man. cherish thee will I honor thou my soul's glory joy and crown fair are the meadows fairer still the woodlands robed in the blooming garb of spring she Jesus is fairer, Jesus is purer, who makes the woeful heart to sing. Beautiful Savior, Lord of the nations, Son of God and Son of man glory and honor praise adoration now and forevermore be thine right before i preach today i've asked ariel to come and she's going to read a special poem for our moms today you're special to the Lord, and you're valued in his eyes, for no one loves you more. And mom, I want you to know how blessed you really are, for I know that it was never easy. Some years have been quite hard. But even through the years gone by, I know that God was there, 
reaching out with loving arms though we were unaware. And he is still beside you, longing to be a part of all the things that interest you, for you're special in his heart. Even in the daily struggles that seem to be a part of life, the Lord longs to be involved and fill the void inside. So mom, on this Mother's Day, I just want you to know that you are always appreciated and that Jesus loves you so. Thank you, Ariel, for that. And again, to every mom, happy Mother's Day to you, and I trust it will be a really nice day for you. And, uh, just a chance for your family to honor you for all the things that you do. I preached a few weeks ago and made mention in Psalms where David said about his desire to be in the house of God, and he makes reference to the swallows building nests in the altar. Well, there's some birds that have decided to build a nest here inside this so if you see birds flying in and out, I'll be okay. Uh, but if they decide to build a nest in my hair, uh, then I'll be in trouble. But anyway, well, let's go ahead and we'll take our Bibles this morning. I want you to turn to a very familiar passage, Proverbs 31. I was thinking about this early in the week. It's been, I think, a long, long time since I've preached out of Proverbs 31. And of course, you know the obvious reason. Today is Mother's Day. And so I want you to read just one verse as we begin this morning. That's Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10. Let's have prayer first, and then we'll get right into the message today. Father, again, I praise you that you love us the way you do. I praise you for your example of what a good parent should be, the way you love us, despite the things that we do. I thank you for your mercy, your grace, your compassion your long-suffering, your gentleness to us, your goodness. Lord, help us as parents, and these ladies, to show that kind of love to their families, to their children especially. Lord, I, I would ask that this would be a special day for them. I know this is your day, Father. This is the Lord's day. But I'm grateful that we have this, this time each year to just recognize those women in our life who have not only brought forth into the world their children, but raised them and loved them, and many times are the the reason that these children come to Christ. I ask you bless them today. I ask you bless your word and use it for good. God will thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Proverbs chapter 31, and we're looking at the 10th verse. Very familiar words. It says, Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies now there's a question here for you and me to ponder this morning it says who can find a virtuous woman now, as you ponder that question you need to observe two facts that we find here in this particular verse the first is this when you look at this verse and really think about it you come to this understanding that a virtuous woman is rare, just by the statement, who can find a virtuous woman? And I'll be, I'll be honest with you, uh, they're, they're hard to find. Ask a young man who is seeking out a wife, they're hard to find, especially in our generation. The second thought is this, in this verse, that a virtuous woman is of great value. It says her price is far above rubies. Now, gentlemen, listen. If you have found a virtuous woman, you have found a gem. You have. To those young men, and we have some here this morning that have not yet uh, entered into marriage, but you're near or at that age now, I want to say to you that finding a virtuous woman is well worth the wait. It's well worth the wait. Uh, you know my background, you know my story, my family history uh, fairly well. And I had a great desire when I turned 15 or 16 to be married. Now that may sound strange, but I wanted to be married. And I, in my mind, it was like by the time I'm 20, I want to be married, I have a family. And God saw fit in his wisdom to delay that until I was 26 years of age. Now that wasn't my desire, but that was God's desire. But God gave me a virtuous woman. It was well worth the wait. And guys, let me tell you something. Don't get antsy. You wait on God. You let him bring that right woman, that virtuous woman into your life. 
the adjective virtuous. It has a tremendous meaning. And it may not have quite the meaning that we think. Now there's the word virtue that's most often found in the New Testament. And this adjective, this word virtuous, has, a, has an interesting meaning. If you were to look it up, it would say this. An army, an army, valor, strength, great force, and virtue. Now, when I looked at that word, I was not expecting to see the words an army, or necessarily valor. And yet the word virtuous carries with it that meaning. So, think about this. A virtuous woman is like an army of one with enduring strength, valor, and moral excellence. And right now, seated beside you men, more than likely is a woman that fits that definition. Praise the Lord for it. Now, those women may be rare, but they're worth finding. And the Bible itself really gives you the fullest definition of what it means to be virtuous, and it's found right here in Proverbs 31. I find this, this interesting. In the Bible, you find this word virtuous three times, three times in Scripture. And all three times that it's used references a woman, never a man, a woman. Here in Proverbs 31.10, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? The second is Proverbs 12.4. It says, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. And that's true. That's true. And the third reference is found in Ruth chapter 3, verse 11. It says, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. In the Bible... Ruth is the only woman in Scripture referred to as virtuous. She is and was virtue personified. Now, we certainly know there were other virtuous women in the Bible. Think about Hannah. Think about Esther. We think about uh, Mary. We think about uh, Martha, some of these women of Scripture that were certainly would have qualified as virtuous women. But in God's wisdom and for His purposes, the only time we see personified this, this thought of, vir of being virtuous is found in Ruth. Now, I want you to look with me this morning at this definition. God's definition of a woman who is virtuous. When we go back to verse 10 again, and this is what you find as far as this definition of being a virtuous woman. She is valuable and she is rare. Now there's an interesting statement. I'm going to compare. I, I won't have you turn to the book of Ruth. But I'm going to compare Ruth since she is the one personified as being virtuous. And I'm going to look at her life as we examine this definition of virtuousness. Of a woman having uh, that part in her life. In Ruth chapter 3, verse 10, we hear these words. And Boaz said, Blessed art thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. Now, let me first give you a little bit of a background before we think about that verse. When you come to the book of Ruth, you're not introduced to Ruth. You are introduced to a man named Elimelech and his wife, Naomi. They have two sons. One's name is Malon, and the other one's name is Kilion. And these folks lived in Bethlehem there in Judah. The Bible says that a famine had hit that area, and uh, Elimelech made the decision that in order to provide for his family and for their safety, they would leave Israel and venture into Moab territory. Now you know that God had cursed the Moabites. And yet Elimelech made this decision to leave the place of God's land and venture into Moab. When you read the first chapter of Ruth, you find that they were there for a period of 10 years in Moab. And during that, near the end of those 10 years, Naomi found out that 
Israel was once again uh, functioning as they had normally functioned that she could provide back in Bethlehem. So she made the decision to leave Moab and return to her homeland and to return to Bethlehem. And when she did so, she said to her two daughter-in-laws, one by the name of Orpah and the other by the name of Ruth, I want you to remain, but I'm going back home. I'm going back to my homeland. She said, I came in full. I'm leaving empty. God has judged me. God has really cursed me. She said, don't call me Ruth or uh, Naomi anymore. Call me Mara because of the bitterness that has struck my life. Both Orpah and Ruth said, no, no, no. If you're going back to Israel, we're going with you. We've learned to love you. You've been there for us in our sorrow, and we're going to return. She said, my daughters, listen, you, you are not Jewish. You've never lived among my people. And, and everyone knows, we know the attitude that the Jewish people had toward Gentiles. She said, I would encourage you not to return. This is your culture. This is your land. These are your people remain here. And Orpah finally agreed to that and remained. But Ruth made the decision to go back with her mother-in-law. And one of the most beautiful passages in Scripture, and you, you, there's a song written for weddings that uses this reference. And I'm sure many of you who have been to weddings have heard this song, at least in years past. And it's based on chapter 1 of Ruth, verse 16. There it says, Ruth speaking to her mother-in-law, she says, Entreat me never to leave thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. And Ruth made a calculated decision to return to, or go with, Naomi as she returned to her homeland. It was a risk to this woman, because she would have more than likely have known rejection. And I'm sure when she did enter into Bethlehem, there was times where people looked down upon her, questioned Naomi's judgment, and mistreated Ruth. Nevertheless, she made that decision to go. And when they returned, obviously Naomi is now an older woman, and Ruth, still young, relatively young, made the decision to care for her mother-in-law. But she would do it from a position of what the poor would do. And that would be to go and glean in the fields after a field had been harvested, whether it was barley or whether it was wheat. And so every day she would go out early in the daytime and often work through the day going over a field that had already been harvested just to find loose grain so that Naomi and she would have something to survive on. And that's what she did. The Bible says that a man by the name of Boaz took note of Ruth and he made that statement as we read earlier. Blessed be thou the Lord my daughter for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning. Now, you've been more kind to your mother-in-law now than when you first entered into the family when your husband was alive and things were going well for you back in Moab. You're, you're showing more kindness now than you did then. And as much as thou hast followed not young men, whether poor or rich. You know, you're still young, Ruth. You, you could pursue marriage instead of remaining with your mother-in-law, and, and you're an attractive woman. Certainly someone would sweep you off your feet, even here in Israel. But you've made the decision not to remarry, at least not at this point. You're not seeking a young man, whether he's poor or rich. You're not interested just in the, the physical side of marriage, the, 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 you know, the appearance of someone. You're not interested in those things. Your focus is on caring for your mother-in-law. And Boaz took note of that. And I make a big deal out of this for this reason. Remember, the Bible says that a virtuous woman is rare. To find a virtuous woman is a big deal. Now, some of you are familiar with the, the Jewish Midrash. It was a uh, somewhat like a, a biblical commentary. It was written after a Christ was on earth from the years 400 to about 1200. These Jewish rabbis basically made comment uh, upon 
the scriptures. And when they wrote about the book of Ruth, they made this observation. They said they, they believed that Boaz was twice as old as Ruth. It wasn't just a few years difference. So if, and this is a fairly safe assumption, that by the time they are back in Bethlehem, that Ruth would have been at least 30 years of age, and that would have made her husband, or would have made Boaz, 60. Now, here's Boaz, and I want you to think about this. He has waited for 60 years for a virtuous woman. He has waited 60 years for a virtuous woman. Now, to the young men who are here, I'm not saying to you that you'll have to wait until you're 60 years of age to get married. But I am saying this, it is well worth the wait. Now, you know, we've, we've had a lot of young adults in our church through the years, and one of the young ladies that has been part of this church family for several years is now living in Oklahoma, is Missy Ricker. One of the prayers I've had for her and several other young women and, and the young men in our church is that God would bring them uh, godly mates. And Misty's getting married this May in Oklahoma to a young man out of the church that she attends, Eastland Baptist Church. She's getting married, I think it's on May 28th. And I, I, that may not mean anything to you, but that, that thrills me because for years I have prayed for her. For years I have prayed for people like Trent and, and others of our young adults, uh, Ty and others, that God would bring them godly women into their life. And that for the young women out of our church, like Misty and Megan and others, that God would just bring them a godly mate, that they would wait on God's timing. Misty is, I think, 33 or 34 years of age. She probably won't want me to say that you're here. But, you know, she has waited. She has waited. It's well worth the wait. And Boaz waited to find a virtuous woman. Boaz was wealthy. He probably could have had his pick of anybody because a woman would have been interested in marrying someone with wealth but he chose to wait it's well worth the wait so here's the definition to begin with of a virtuous woman she's rare and she is priceless before God now look at verse 11 of Proverbs 31 it says the heart of her husband does safely trust in her here is another part of the definition of a virtuous woman. She is trusted. She is trusted. When you read the story of Ruth, you find that Ruth became a trusted woman. Now remember, she is a Moabite. She is part of a people that are cursed. And yet, you find Naomi trusting Ruth with her life, her well-being to this young woman. And she earned that trust by her actions. The way that she cared for her mother, her mother-in-law's welfare through all those years. And listen, at any point she would have been justified to say, I'm going home. This isn't my homeland. These aren't my people. This is not my language. This is not my culture. This isn't even my religion necessarily. I'm going back to Moab. Or she could have said, hey, forget this living like a poor woman. I'm going to find someone who's rich and marry this guy and get out of this condition. But that wasn't Ruth's attitude. Naomi was able to trust Ruth. Naomi was able to trust Ruth. I ask you, ladies, are your husbands able to trust you? Are your children able to trust you? That is one of the qualities of being a virtuous woman. One of the great qualities of being a virtuous woman. Notice verse 12. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Here's another part of this definition of a virtuous woman. She is good. She is good. You know, the Bible says there is none good but God. There is none good but God. But when a woman becomes virtuous, and of course, we'll see later on what happened in Ruth's life, that character of God enters into the life. And if you'll take advantage of it, you can be good. You can be good. 
In Ruth chapter 4, verse 15, we hear these words. It says, For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons. In chapter 4, and I'm kind of jumping ahead here in the story. Of course, you, most of you know the story that Boaz and Ruth ended up getting married. And Ruth was with child, and when she was about to give, or after she had given birth to her son, the ladies of Bethlehem gathered, as their custom was. And the women said that statement to Naomi. She said, Ruth, which loveth thee, is better to thee than seven sons. Now, now think about the definition we gave to begin with. That the word virtuous means an army or a great force. And I made the statement, like it's like an army of one. And you kind of see that in that statement. Hey, your daughter-in-law, who did not have to return here, who has spent all this time caring for you when she could have pursued other things. She has been better to you than seven sons. Now listen, seven sons can get a lot done. If you grew up on a dairy farm, you know, a lot of sons are a good thing. And these women said, she is better to you than seven sons. She has been so caring for you, so good to you. That's one of the definitions of being a virtuous woman, just simply being good to others, being good to your husband, being good to your children, ministering to them the way that Ruth did. Oh, you know, this verse 13 of Proverbs 31. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. There you find that she's hard working. Look at verse 14. She is like the merchant ships, which bringeth forth her food from afar. Here you see that she is diligent. Look at verse 15. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. There you see the attitude and the aspect of the fact that she is tireless. Now, if you'd like, you're welcome to. I'm going to go back to the book of Ruth, chapter 2. I'm going to read a passage to you. Ruth, chapter 2. And I'm going to read verses 2 through 7. Ruth chapter 2, verses 2 through 7. I want you to notice carefully these words. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn, after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came, and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light upon a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was the, of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servants that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi, out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came, and notice these statements, she came and hath continued even from morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Now, I want you to notice that statement. She hath continued even from morning until now. What does that show you? It shows you that she was hardworking, she was diligent, and she was tireless. As you continue to read in this chapter, you find out that after she took a break, she went back to the fields and worked till evening. And this wasn't just a one-day thing. This was her course of life in caring for her mother-in-law. And remember, this is what the poor did. When you go back and read in the books of Moses, this is what the poor did. They went and gleaned in the fields after the fields were harvested. And she didn't find it something that was below her dignity to do. Whatever she had to do to care for her mother-in-law, she was going to do it. And she displayed hard work and diligence and a tirelessness to care for this older woman that she had come to greatly love. 
I want you to notice verse 16 back in Proverbs 31. Look at verse 16. She considereth the field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. Here you find that she's industrious. Verse 17. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengthened her arms. So that's pretty obvious there. She is strong. And by the way, anyone who bears children and raises those children has to have uh, strength. Now, you may not be able to lift as much weight as your husband can. You may not have, you know, and this is typical between the male and the female, most women are not physically as strong as the male. But there is a strength in women that men do not have. Uh, when the baby cries at 3 in the morning, who gets up and tends the baby? Normally, unless your wife is sick, the woman does. Who's the one that deals with the children and cares for them? Normally, the wife does. The mother does. There's a strength there. And God says, let me, let me give you a definition of a virtuous woman. This is the woman who has a strength to care for her family, to minister to her family. And that's not always easy to do. When I go back to the book of Ruth, in chapter 2, I want you to notice these words found in verses 17 and 18. It says, So she gleaned in the field until even, and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. And she brought forth and gave to her that had reserved, she gave to her that she had reserved after that she was sufficed. And then verse 23, so she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest and dwell with her mother-in-law. Now, here's something interesting. It talks about in verse 23 that she gleaned unto the end of barley harvest and wheat harvest. These did not occur simultaneously. These were different times of the years. Barley harvest was late uh, March, early April, and then the wheat harvest was uh, late May into June. Uh, what does that tell you? It tells you that she had a strength about her. It tells you again that she had a diligent attitude and a tirelessness about her. And in that statement you find this woman doing what she did not just to satisfy her own need much more to make sure that her family now what does her family consist of an old woman and she's going to take care of that woman she's going to do anything and everything she had to to make sure that Naomi's needs were well met and she did she did now you go back to Proverbs chapter 31 look at verse 18. And I'll just give you these. We won't go over all of these, but just show you what I see through this. Verse 18 says, She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. Now, you notice the word perceive. A virtuous woman, according to the scripture, is a woman who has perception. She has a wisdom about her. She has a wisdom about her. Verse 19. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. If you are into uh, making clothes or quilting, you understand those terms. What do you find there? You find that she's productive. Certainly, Naomi was a productive woman when it came to caring for Naomi. Uh, rather, Ruth was a productive woman caring for Naomi. Look at verse 20. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. You find that she is caring. Now, one of the statements that Naomi made when she returned and her neighbors questioned her, she said, I went out full and I came back empty. Naomi didn't have much. And at that stage in her life, it may have been well nigh to impossible for her to provide for her own needs. She didn't have a husband. Her sons are dead. Orpah has decided to remain in Moab, and she's dependent on one person, Ruth, to provide her needs. 
And what does this woman do? She cares for her mother-in-law. She ministers to her mother-in-law. Look at verse 21 of Proverbs 31. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. In that, I see the fact that she is protected. She's going to do anything she can to protect her family. Here again, that's very obvious in the character of Ruth as she protects and cares for her mother-in-law. Look at verse 22. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry, her clothing is silk and purple. Now there's some different things you can see in that, but I'm just going to give you one. Just she is she's skillful. Um, not every woman can sew, not every woman can quilt, and that doesn't necessarily, whether you can or cannot, make you virtuous or non-virtuous, but it certainly is one of those things in which somebody would say, hey, you know what? I want to learn these skills so that I can minister to my own family. You know, in our culture today, that may not be as necessary as it was in generations past. You can go down to Kohl's, you can go to Walmart, you can go to the mall and find the things that are needed as far as clothing and, and things to decorate the home. But that wasn't true back then. There's just a certain character about a woman who is willing to lend herself to developing skills to provide for her family. And uh, it's, it's interesting, I, I know a number of our ladies here have special skills that God has given you. And a lot of you use those special skills to do things, even if you don't necessarily work outside the home. Of course, right now, nobody seems to be working outside the home. But, you know, normally, the Bible talks about a woman being a keeper at home. And you find sometimes when those women remain at home with their children, they still find ways to develop skills in which they can provide extra income or do special things for their children. My wife has been great at that over the years. Still to this day, uh, she does, uh, she amazes me to be honest, the things that she does uh, to provide, to help provide for our family. And just, you walk in my house and uh, it's a beautiful place. I love seeing my house. I enjoy walking into my house because she keeps it so well decorated. Just, it's beautiful. And because she's developed skills over the years, and, that's so much appreciated. Now notice verse 23 of Proverbs 31. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. Just a simple thing. She is beneficial. Ladies, let me ask you this. Are you beneficial to your husband? And are you beneficial to your children? Are you a blessing to your family? Or are you a curse? I have been around some women who were not a blessing to their family. They were cursed to their family. They were not loving to their children. They were brutal to their children. They were not loving and caring to their husband. They were unfaithful to their husband. Not every woman, even those who call themselves Christians, are virtuous. And if that is true in your life, if in your life you are virtuous, you are special. You are special. And husbands, listen to me. If you have a wife like that, it shouldn't be just Mother's Day in which you honor her. She really should be honored all the days of her life. Notice verse 24. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Here, I just bring out the thought and this definition of being virtuous. Someone who is prudent, she is prudent. The word prudent means this. It means shrewdness in the management of affairs, skill, and good judgment in the use of resources. For most, and this has been true in my life, uh, we had four children, and normally I would be gone here at ministry. You know, when we were younger, we lived in Philippine, and I'd be gone all day. My wife was there with the four children. And it was really upon her to do most of the things that were necessary for the benefit of those children. And I found this to be true. She had a prudency about her. 
And, and again, hopefully that can be said just about every woman here. And that certainly was true for Ruth. She became very prudent, very shrewd in the way that she handled things so that other people began to take note of what she did to provide for Naomi. They took special note to see the character that she had developed. Now, was she always like that? Was she like that when she was married to Naomi's son? Well, we have no idea. But one thing is sure, when she entered into this relationship of widowhood and still caring for mother-in-law, these things were prevalent in her life. Notice verse 25. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. Strength and honor. A virtuous woman is an honorable woman. A virtuous woman is an honorable woman. She is above reproach. She's above reproach. That became the reality of a Moabite. Moabites weren't highly thought of. They were the enemies of Israel. They had a curse placed upon them. There was a Moabite woman who entered into Bethlehem, Judah, and she became known as an honorable woman. And we'll see that here in just a moment. Notice verse 26 as we come to the end here. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. A virtuous woman is wise, and a virtuous woman is kind. You know, Solomon, who, it's, it's funny because God uses him to write the book of wisdom. And I don't know how wise he was when it came to marrying women because he had a lot of wives. But he makes, I think, three times statements in, in the Proverbs about it'd be better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than with a contentious and brawling woman. Three times he makes statements along those lines about women. I would imagine he spoke from experience. I would imagine that some of those 700 wives were wives that weren't all that, you know, wise and kind. He spoke from experience. I, there's just something special about a woman who has a quiet spirit. I don't, I don't mean that she never talks. I just mean she has a quiet spirit, a meek and quiet spirit that is, that is portrayed in, I believe it's 1 Peter chapter 2, when it talks about, a woman who has a husband who may not be saved. How do you win him to Christ? Part of that comes from a meek and quiet spirit. A woman who's wise and kind. Notice verse 27 of Proverbs 31. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. This to me is, is pretty, pretty obvious. She is loving. She loves her children. And she'll do anything she can to care for them. Now, when we're introduced to Ruth, she is not a mom yet. But when you come to the end of that short book, she has a privilege, even though she is maybe older than most to bore children, she had the privilege of becoming a mom. And a pretty significant person that God allowed her to raise. And then look at verse 28. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Now, you say, what do you see there? Well, I, I see here that the only crowd that she really needs or wants to please is her family. And that's part of the definition that God gives of a virtuous woman. The ones that she is concerned about pleasing isn't the ladies at the bridge club. It's not the people in that uh, exercise class that she meets with every you know, Thursday afternoon or whatever it may be. The ones that she is concerned about and is seeking to please isn't trying to climb the corporate ladder, isn't trying to make a name for herself out in society, it's her family. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he prays with her wife because she has showered them with her love. That's her main concern. Ladies, I'm going to tell you something. I don't have any problem with a woman working. I'd be a hypocrite to say otherwise because my wife has had to work for several years. But I will say this. If the thing that makes you go 
is trying to build a name for yourself out in the world, that's not part of the definition of being virtuous. If your main concern is not your children and your spouse, you don't qualify in this definition of being virtuous. That should be your focus. That's where your heart ought to be. You notice verse 30. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Here's a reality of life for all of us. I'm in my 60s now. I don't look like I did when I was 25 or 26 years of age. I don't look the same. And no, it's not like, you know, the fine wine that gets better with age. It's not like that. Ladies, I think it's right. I think it's proper for you to try to take care of yourself physically and to be as presentable as you possibly can. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. And the Bible even, even alludes to that fact that that's a good thing. But again, that should not be the focus of a virtuous woman. That focus should not be on your outward appearance, but that focus should be on fearing the Lord. Maybe the greatest part of the definition of being a virtuous woman is this. This woman fears the Lord. Now, that disqualifies a bunch of ladies. That disqualifies every lost woman on the face of the earth. You say, can a lost woman have virtuous qualities? Yes. But in God's eyes, she cannot be a virtuous woman because a virtuous woman, even though it's listed last, is the most important aspect, and that is this. She fears God. You say, did Ruth qualify in that? Well, listen. Let me go back again to Ruth chapter 2 and listen to verses 11 and 12. Boaz is just learning about this woman. He apparently had been asking questions. He heard about this Moabite who was living with his relative. Now that was not normally pleasing to a Jew. But he began to investigate about this woman. And when he has his first conversation with Ruth, I want you to notice what he says to her. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath been fully showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, now listen to these words, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. You know what Boaz found out? He found out that this Moabite woman who used to worship pagan gods did exactly what she had said were mother-in-law all those months before. Thy God shall be my thy God shall be my God. And there came a point, it's very obvious. We hear it. And it was very obvious to the people there in Bethlehem. Hey, she may have come from Moab. She may have of uh, descent from the nation of Moab, but she doesn't act like a Moabite now. She has come to trust God. She has come to put her faith in God. Listen, you really want to be a virtuous woman. It begins by learning to fear God. And the greatest moment of fearing God is the moment you realize that Without Jesus Christ, I am nothing. Without Jesus Christ as my Savior, I have no hope. There came a point in this woman's life that she put her trust in the God of Israel, and her life was changed. Her character was changed. So I ask every mom here this morning, and I extend that to everyone else. Do you know that you know that you know that Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord? Do you know that you know that there has been a moment in your life where you turn from your sin and put your faith alone in Jesus Christ? That moment where you feared Him. He said, I realize who you are, God, holy and just. I realize I deserve punishment for my sin. But I also realize that you love me you sent your son to die for me 
and you have paid my punishment. You've paid the price of my punishment so that I don't have to bear that sentence. And I choose to put my trust in what you did on Calvary. I choose to make you my Savior. I trust that you've never done that. You'll do that this morning. You'll do it right now. If you have, you say, I, I want to be a virtuous woman. Well, you know what? Here's a good example. The only person personified with the, with the attitude of being virtuous is Ruth. Examine her life. Go back to the book of Proverbs, chapter 31. Examine what God says a virtuous woman is. And simply follow the example. God's given us examples in his word. Yes, the Lord Jesus, obviously the chief example. We're to follow in his steps. But you know what? God gives us a bunch of examples to follow, a bunch of people. Ruth is not the only woman that you could pattern your life after. But God certainly wants you to be a virtuous woman. And listen, if you are, and look, hey, men, when you drive out of here, you turn to your wife and tell her. If she's a virtuous woman, if you perceive her that way, let her know. Praise her for it. Her husband praises her. There's nothing wrong with that. That's In fact, that's a biblical, godly thing to do. Let her know. Praise her for it. And if, as a woman, you say, you know, there's some things here mentioned that aren't necessarily part of my life. Make it part of your life. Let this definition be a definition of you. Great that it's a definition of Ruth. Let it be a definition of you. I want you to bow your heads for just a moment. And as you bow your heads, I just want you to think, ladies, especially to you. Listen, whether you're a mom or not, just I want you to think, am I really a virtuous woman? Are these qualities qualities that I possess? And if you say, not all, then listen. You can make the decision today. God, with your help, through the power of the Holy Spirit, I will choose to begin to live this way. Now listen, you can't do it on your own, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can. And I encourage you to do so. Men, listen. To be virtuous isn't limited to a, to a woman or to a mom. You and I need to be virtuous too. We need to have many of these qualities in our own life. And if you examine your life today and say, I'm not living a virtuous life, you can. You can repent of it, get right with God about it, and begin to live a virtuous life. And if you're here without Christ today, you can simply right where you're at, bow your head and ask Him to be your Savior. Ask Him to cleanse you from sin. Ask Him to change your life. It's apparent, and it's very apparent that Ruth did this. And it so changed your life that a bunch of Jewish people who hated the Moabites began to have a respect and a great deal of honor toward this woman Ruth. When you come to the end of the life after Boaz and her are married and she bears this child, the people praise her for her, for her quality and character. By the way, she did not become a mom eventually she became a grandmother and then a great-grandmother. She was the great-grandmother of a man that you know, a man by the name of David, the king of Israel. Quite a blessing. The great-grandmother of King David was a Moabite woman who had her life changed. I don't, I don't care what your background is. I don't care what you came out of. God can change you. God can bless you. God can use you. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it has the power to change all of us. And I'm, I'm standing in front of a group of folks who have been changed by your power. Many of the women who are seated in their cars in front of me have learned to live a virtuous life. And it began when they chose to fear you and make you the center of their life. I pray that it continue to be true for them. I ask that you would bless every mom here today. Just give them a wonderful day with their family. The Lord, uh, certainly look forward to this evening. And uh, I realize not all will be able to come, but those who do come, I pray God just be a, a blessed time in our service this evening. We'll thank you for all that's done. In 
pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, happy Mother's Day to you. And trust you'll have a good afternoon for those who are able to be here tonight. We look forward to seeing you. For those who can't, just have a blessed day with your family. Bye. How are you today? Good, how are you?